Samuel, if you want to go first, uh, introduce yourself. My name is Samuel Johnson. I've been uh, working on bicycles since 2002. Got a good break with Shimano, where I've been for the last, uh, I guess, 10 or 11 years before I came to Hunt here. The U.S. company, we're based out of Colorado, so Hunt USA um, mm-hmm. is uh, Colorado and Boulder. So huh, okay. And, and Kenneth, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah. My name is Kenneth Rodriguez Clisham. Uh, I, my role here at Hunt, I focus on sort of all of the marketing for North America and part of Canada. Um, I focus primarily on the road, gravel, uh, triathlon side of the business. Great. Uh, so could either of you tell me a little bit about the background of, of Hunt? Hunt was founded in late 2015 by two brothers, Tom and Pete Marchment. Tom had worked in the industry for one of uh, the UK's larger distributors, um, and he just wasn't particularly satisfied with the sort of quality of alloy wheels that were being, uh, I guess, distributed out to customers on stock, like OEM packages. And they realized that that was sort of an opportunity for them to help better riders, um, for the people who can't necessarily afford carbon race wheels or lightweight carbon climbing wheels. Like, so they set out to essentially make an amazing alloy wheel set that would be bomb proof, not terribly flexible, but stiff, uh, and something that could survive the UK winter really. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, a few years later down the road, they started to introduce carbon into the range. And in early 2018, we hired on Luis Agrippone, who's our head engineer uh, and sort of chief science officer here at Hunt, to sort of help us sort of bring carbon um, and bring our alloy and carbon development into the next level. Um, and so thanks to her expertise, formerly working at 3T and Campagnolo, and working alongside the Cervelo test team, she was able to sort of help us broaden our knowledge of carbon and alloy and uh, really help us launch sort of the new tier of Hunt products uh, that we have offering with our Limitless and Aerodynamicist uh, ranges. I bought myself a pair of 33 Aero carbon wheels and uh, I've been enjoying them. I had a couple of questions. Um, they, they, in the owner's manual that's available online, it, they describe the wheels as um, having something called uh, H-lock wedge uh, profile to them. Can you explain what that means? Because uh, I, I found that there was a few contradictions uh, in some of the information that was provided, including even the cross-section drawing that shows what the rims are, are supposed to look like. H-lock, I guess, is really designed to secure a tire. So all of our wheels, I guess, first off, are um, tubeless ready. Mm-hmm. Um, so they meet all the ETRTO standards, and or exceed, rather. And um, so H-lock is really our way of securing the tire into the bead of the rim so that uh, we get a wider range, I, I suppose, of, of brands. You, I guess you probably have a lot of experience in tires sort of fitting certain ways on different wheels. Mm-hmm. And uh, Hunt Wheels are one of the brands that I've found. Basically, we have a super wide range, more so than I think a lot of our competitors. Um, they have a really secure fit. They have a really tight mm-hmm. fit. We find that when uh, the bead sort of snaps after that initial installation, uh, they tend to hold. We do a lot of testing and make sure before, because we, we, I guess we also offer um, wheels being shipped tubeless mm-hmm. uh, as part of um, as part of the deal when you check out with us, or as an option when you check out with us. And effectively, we just wanted to offer our customers that sort of added benefit of mm-hmm. not having to go that extra step and mm-hmm. going to source a tire somewhere else, figure out sealant, and then get everything fit on their own. So um, H-Lock, I guess the foundation is really to ensure that uh, we've got a wide range of tires that really fit securely in terms of safety, in terms of not having to um, continually uh, reinflate. Well, they certainly fit very, very securely with the uh, uh, with the Schwalbe tires that I put on them myself. 
Um, the, the question that, that sort of came to my mind when I was originally looking at them was in the drawing showing them, they showed them as not having a hook on the lip of the rim. But in fact, they have some kind of hook. It certainly um, interfaces perfectly with the, uh, with the Schwalbe tubeless tires that I, that I put on. Um, but it sure, to me, to my untrained eye, looks like a hook on a, on a, on a conventional rim. Um, but your documentation says not to use tires that are, uh, that are not tubeless ready. I think that's just one of the unfortunate parts of our website that hasn't been updated in a while. Uh, sort of as a company, we wanted to be pioneers in the tubeless, mm -hmm. uh, road tubeless category. Uh, and so that's sort of why we put the development behind the H-Lock uh, back, I believe it was 2016 is when we started to do that. But um, during that time, we had offered one hookless version. So that's the old drawing, in other words. Correct. Yeah, since we, we've sort of gotten rid of the, the hookless wheel uh, set, and all of our wheel sets are still using a conventional hooked rim design. But I think it might have just been, just flew under the radar up until okay. we had someone with So the question is, can you use a Kevlar beaded non-tubeless ready tire on, on that? Um, because it sure looks like it would hold. We don't want to start choosing for our riders what tire they use. And so ultimately, we, we just were receiving a bunch of feedback saying like, listen, I still want to use my tubeless GP 5000s. I still want to use mm -hmm. this tire. And we decided ultimately, like we wanted to create the best product for our riders. And that was not, and that was in turn not restricting them on what tire they brought on their bike. So you're saying that you could pretty much put any kind of tire on that. So, so my question to you is, if, does H-lock, is there a clear specification for what H-lock wedge rims are? Do, do they have a hook on them? They currently do, yeah. Okay. They're, okay. they're hooked and then you saw, I think, the profile. Yeah, I think that that's really very clever design. I, I'm very impressed with, with the whole profile of that and that the, the shoulder of the the inside of the rim is uh, very well thought out. Um, so I guess the bottom line is that uh, you, you've sort of stayed ahead of yourself in order to make the, the, the rims uh, compatible with virtually any, any tire out there. Okay. That's the goal, yeah. We're really glad that you're kind of exploring this really deeply, Saul, too. Um, we, we feel we have maybe some critics out there that think that we're just another sort of Chinese carbon wheel company. And we actually put a lot of engineering, which you well, found. And to be honest with you, that's what really impressed me. The only criticism I have is that the documentation is, is contradictory and confusing. That, that's good. And I'm glad that you guys were able to, to clarify that, that point. In your documentation, it also says never exceed 100 PSI. On, on, on the tires. Um, my experience when I put my Schwalbe tires on at 100 PSI, I couldn't get them, with a tube in them at 100 PSI, I, I could not get the, get the beads to seat um, until I pumped it up to about 120. And then it, then it popped on just beautifully and, and, and centered itself and, and, it was, and it was great. But uh, what threw me was the fact that in your documentation it says not to exceed 100 pounds. And I thought, okay, well, I'll just pump it up to what I'll probably ride on, which is 80 pounds. And the tire was sort of sitting pretty wonky on the rim and wasn't going to be centered and wasn't uh, sitting on the, on the bead uh, seat properly. The 100 uh, PSI um, recommendation is probably really more our insurance company and lawyers. Sure. Um, wanting us to keep things protected and we actually internally make sure that um, I, I mentioned to you that we fit a lot of uh, tires uh, for our customers in the mm -hmm. box shipped out to them and we actually don't go over a hundred at all um, mm -hmm. in our own warehouse when we're 
installing tires. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if we find something that doesn't seat properly, um, all of our guys are trained to have their like soapy water bottle yeah. ready to go. There's quite a bit more. There's a large increased percentage of tire bead that's now in contact with the rim because of that shape of the age lock. Mm -hmm. So they are going to probably seat a little bit, um, a little bit slower, maybe more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, uh, us mechanics, we've been trained to probably do it the wrong way, over inflate until it seats and then back it off, which yeah, is really not the, not the best way to go about it. Well, I, I loaded it up with soapy water too, and uh, yeah, yeah. and and but at 80 pounds, I wasn't going to get it to to, to do it. Was that with a tube as well? Yeah, that's with a tube. So the tube also creates some internal friction, so it hold, tends to hold the the tire back. Where I imagine tubeless, it would probably slide on a lot a lot easier with less pressure. After I add sealant, I tend to, I, I try to do a dry fit, and if it's not going, I'll deflate it completely, kind of pull the bead out, add my sealant, and give it a spin so that sealant kind of works its way into that sort of yeah. beach log yeah. bed, yeah. Um, and it tends to act as like a lubricant yeah. in addition to helping seal as well. Plus, when you're, when you're blowing up for uh, tubeless, you're trying to get that air in there really quickly, so that, whereas I'm, I was just using a hand pump, and a slow pressurization at sure. 80 pounds, it was still sticking back. So anyway, so that, was, that yeah. was my experience. Tell me, everybody's pushing the, the merits of tubeless tires. Um, what, what is your take on it? Obviously, you're for it. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, uh, and, and, I, and I gather with the choices in tubeless tire and tubeless wheels, um, you're staking your future on uh, on that direction. We definitely feel that really like the baseline is the ability to run lower pressures. Um, the puncture resistance we feel is really great for road all around use. Uh, we can get a much better um, uh, much better grip and much more comfort out of, of running tubeless. We believe so. Uh, it just seems to make sense. It sort of checks all the boxes. When you're running such a high uh, PSI in your tires and they're so firm, sort of, although we wish we could always be riding on perfectly smooth pavement, that's not always pavement, that's not always the case. And so all of that road noise is constantly sort of moving you and the bike up. And that's just a lot of sort of energy that's being lost. Mm -hmm. And so if you can run a lower PSI, if you can have a smoother ride, that inherently will mean less energy spent sort of fighting against mm -hmm. sort of the road noise and sort of the, the loss of traction that you mm -hmm. get. So in turn, it's just more efficient, more comfortable ride, uh, similar to what Samuel had said. So mm -hmm. that's kind of why we're staking everything on it. Um, and sort of as we've seen the bigger sort of brands in the industry come out recently, it seems that everybody's jumping on board mm -hmm. of tubeless as well. Mm -hmm. Those are good reasons. <laughs> the, the, there are some bad reasons that, that I've been hearing too. And, uh, you know, the one that, that sort of kind of irks me is the one where people say that uh, tubeless is lighter weight. You're using a heavier tire, uh, which basically weighs the same as a, a tube and a lightweight tube and tire, and then you have add a valve and, and sealant. So weight isn't isn't a reason, but those other things are really good reasons. Yeah, there there are I think some negatives out there with tubeless. Um, you know, getting punctures on the road and something that might not seal, or if your sealant is dried up, um, it can be a little bit of a pain to, I guess, change uh, mm -hmm. out in the field. You know, I think people that run tubeless, they think that they don't have to carry anything all of a sudden. So I think maybe informing people that, no, you do still need to carry a tube. So any things in the future that you see coming down from, from Hunt Wheels? A few weeks ago, we had probably one of our biggest launches of 2020, which we were pretty excited about, um, which was our 42 limitless gravel disc. Mm -hmm. So sort of what I had mentioned earlier about bringing Luisa on board, she helped us create a patented uh, technology to try and save rim weight while going sort of towards the more extreme uh sides in terms of external width to achieve a more aerodynamic shape uh, and so we we put that to use in our 48 limitless last year for 
kind of a road crit wheel set. And now we've moved that into gravel uh, with the launch of our 42 limitless gravel disc. So that was that was the biggest launch of the year. We have a couple more coming up uh, probably just after the new year. Mm-hmm. But um, nothing, nothing that I can comment on at the moment. I mean, we will be building out the limitless range quite a bit over the next few years um, and then as well as sort of our utilization of the carbon spoke technology that mm-hmm. we've sort of launched in the, at the beginning of last year as well. So more projects on that front coming mm-hmm. out soon and then we're paying close attention to sort of the, the triathlon world and how we can help riders in that space as well. Mm-hmm. So do you think you've reached the optimal weight to strength ratio on on the wheels or do you think there's much that can be done further to reduce that uh, obviously the carbon spoke thing is a uh, is a weight function not necessarily a performance uh benefit but uh what are your thoughts there i would say that we definitely haven't sort of reached i mean we're always trying to learn always trying to push ourselves and further and so i think I think we're at a great spot considering sort of if we look back five years ago when we started the company, um, we're getting there, but I would say that there's always room to learn um, and always room to improve. So until we reach a technological plateau, I think we're always going to try and push it a little further. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're in, we're in a cool opportunity and a cool position as a company, sort of as small and nimble as we are, to really try a lot of different things and um, and really just kind of push and continue developing. So you mentioned the carbon spoke uh, thing. We're now offering that or will be on uh, a few wheel sets at this point. And it's just a cool way for somebody who, you know, maybe they'll sacrifice a little bit of ride quality if they need the absolute, like, lightest version in that specific width and, you know what I mean? So there are always specifications and we're always looking at individual weights and individual specs on each component of our wheels and trying to always optimize um, anywhere we can. And we're thinking about putting ourselves in our riders' shoes, like, okay, we're developing this wheel for this sort of group of riders. Like, what are they going to want? How how are they going to want their money spent specifically? Like, can we take this out? Can we take this out and, like, spend that money maybe more on a robust rim or more um, robust bearings or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, that's really kind of where we come from whenever we're developing and looking at a new wheel set. So it might be from the position of a bike packer. It might be from um, the viewpoint of a triathlon um, world-class Ironman racer, right? So uh, mm-hmm. always trying to put ourselves in those in that position. So. Mm-hmm. Any, any thoughts on work on the hubs themselves, the hub bodies? Um, and the free hub mechanisms and, and that kind of stuff is, is stuff changing on that on that front for you guys. We haven't had really really very many issues at all with mm-hmm. our hub designs, and we've done a lot of development on our own hubs and tried to optimize again wherever we can. And we think about you know the issue of a cassette that digs into a free hub body, right? Yeah. So we've got this cool technology that puts a steel plate on top yeah, of the free hub that's that very prevents the, the twisting. Yeah. yeah. So um, uh, anyway, so yeah, we're, we are kind of always looking at things like that, and we always want to be developing. And we've got a, a cool group of engineers that's uh, always growing to um, to bring in fresh perspectives. Right now, though, like our, our Hall systems, we've got a number of different models and. Um, they all seem to be very robust, mm-hmm. very low drag, and they seem to all work really, really well. So, and they have and they have a cool sound too. They have a really cool sound. <laughs> Good. We really appreciate it, Saul. You take yeah. an interest in us. Uh, we look up to you in a big way. You've done oh, some really cool geez, stuff, thanks. and you have a great following. And thanks. yeah, uh, kudos as a bike mechanic, uh, to somebody who's as seasoned as you are. So, well, well, thank you very much. That's very kind. Thank you very much, Saul, for your time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, sir. Bye-bye.